couple of seconds for people to, to join and then we'll start. Okay. All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sophie Bolt. I'm vice chair of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, Ukraine, Stop the Slaughter, Peace Now, which has been organised by CND and Stop the War Coalition. Uh, I'm sure we are all utterly horrified by the escalating crisis in the Middle East, with the reports of over 500 people now killed by Israeli military strikes in the Lebanon. And as this hor horror unfolds, we're also facing the worsening situation in Ukraine with yet another dangerous escalation. This current crisis is about whether the US and Britain will enable Ukraine to use their long range missiles to attack deep into Russian territory. This risks an all out war between nuclear armed Russia and the US led nuclear alliance of NATO. For the first time since the Cold War, we face a very real risk of a nuclear confrontation. And yet our new government continues to argue that it will arm Ukraine for as long as it takes, risking even more lives and sustaining this terrible threat of nuclear war. So at this critical time, we've called this meeting to bring together a panel of activists and experts who will put the case for de-escalation an end to arms sales and a desperately needed peace process. So I'm really delighted to um, introduce our first speaker. Um, that's Lindsay German. She's an author and one of the founders and the convener of Stop the War Coalition, Britain's anti-war movement, which was formed back in 2001 out of the opposition to the US led war on terror. Over to you, Lindsay. Great to have you with us. Thank you very much, Sophie, and thanks to everybody for coming. And I'm very pleased to be speaking on this panel with particularly with our comrades from Germany and from Ukraine. Uh, so I hope that uh, we will have a very um, informative uh, meeting uh, meeting tonight. And uh, Sophie has already uh, talked about the dangerous situation we're in. I think it's worth saying that the world is hurtling towards a much, much more um, dangerous situation in terms of the escalation of wars. Uh, the situation in Lebanon is is absolutely critical now, with hundreds of people already being killed with a barbaric attack last week by the Israelis in terms of the exploding pages and uh, and the terrible injuries that uh, that that caused to to people. And that is obviously of immediate concern to us. But we shouldn't forget that today at the UN. Um, a whole number of the world leaders, including Vladimir Zelensky from Ukraine and uh, obviously Joe Biden, who's uh, supported him and is indeed supporting Netanyahu uh, in Israel, that these people are talking about uh, escalating the war. They're talking about far more uh, weapons being provided and they're talking crucially about the change in the use of already uh, existing weapons in Ukraine, particularly the British Storm Shadow missiles, which they now want to be able to target um, deep into Russian territory at Russian military targets. And we all know, um, despite the talk about the smartness of bombs and missiles, we all know that, uh, as we're seeing in Lebanon, uh, that large numbers of uh, civilians can be um, can be targeted and will be targeted in this kind of way. And I think that um, uh, what we're talking about now is a situation where these storm shadows were first delivered in May of 2023. The Ukrainian government said then there is no question of them being used outside of Ukraine, but deliberately... Uh, the various allies of the um, of Ukraine are being um, encouraged by Zelensky, but also uh, many of them, including the British government, have um, every intention of allowing these weapons to be used. This will bring Britain uh, directly into any firing line in terms of retaliation from Russia. And uh, this the threat of retaliation um, is being sort of dismissed by um, the various people who think that 
um, firing these missiles into Russia is a good idea. So, you know, you have on the one hand the view of Vladimir Putin that he's, you know, the most evil person in the world who can do anything and can dominate the whole world and invade any country that he wants to. At the same time, when you say this brings about the threat of nuclear war, then they say, no, he's never going to do it. He won't be worried about, you know, he won't dare do it. It's just bluff. Now, frankly, this is not um, a risk that we should be taking because once you talk about a conflict between nuclear powers, then you are talking about the danger of nuclear weapons being used and alongside nuclear weapons being used, obviously an escalation of the whole conflict and the possibility of mass casualties, not just in Ukraine or in Russia, but uh, elsewhere. And Britain, of course, will be one of the uh, one of the targets. So I think this is um, something that we really have to we really have to recognize and we really have to say how irresponsible uh, the British government, the United States government and their allies are really being over this, that they're uh, they're talking about um, uh Ukraine can win the war. They're talking in this kind of way. They know absolutely clearly that this is not happening and it's not going to happen. The truth is that Russia is advancing on the Eastern Front at quite a considerable rate over recent months. Um, and Ukraine has not been able to deal with that. And even the invasion of Ukraine into Russia, which in itself was an escalation of the conflict. And uh, the truth is that I can't remember another example of a nuclear power being invaded um, by one of its neighbours and that the uh, the danger that that, uh, that uh, uh, poses for everybody. But they went into Kursk province thinking that this would be a gambit which would enable them to have an advantage on the Eastern Front because they believe that uh, Russia would withdraw a lot of its um, troops uh, from from that region. It hasn't been a successful gambit. They haven't got anywhere in terms of uh, Kursk province or not anywhere um, of any real military significance. Um, at the same time, it hasn't stopped Russia from advancing on the Eastern Front. This is recognised. It's also recognised that um, at some point there are going to be um, peace negotiations and there is going to have to be some sort of ceasefire. Very, very few people really believe that Ukraine can win this war. But at the same time, this is and has been from the beginning, not just a war between Ukraine and Russia following Russia's invasion, but it's also been a proxy war between NATO and um, and Russia. And of course, NATO does not want Russia to win this war or even to be perceived as having won this war. And this is what the escalation is all about, the attempt to um, improve Ukraine's position militarily and the attempt, therefore, to give them a much stronger position when it comes to uh, future negotiations. But, of course, this is an incredibly dangerous situation for, for everybody to be in. And the people who are going to suffer immediately are already the people um, the people of Ukraine who are suffering, the people of Russia who are also suffering, the troops on both sides where there are very heavy casualties and where also there are very heavy levels of, of serious injury, of, of amputations and other uh, life-changing in, injuries that are facing, uh, facing both sides. This should be a time, two and a half years into the war, where everybody should be saying, how do we get peace? Instead of which, we're getting the... Um, we're getting the opposite. And Zelensky himself in um, the UN, in New York today, is saying that he's got his own peace plan and that the UN can't operate a peace plan because um, Russia's on the, is one of the five permanent members of the Security Council. Now, this is simply, this is simply untrue. It also ignores that NATO has repeatedly um, bypassed and ignored and uh, opposed the UN over a whole range of wars that it has been involved in, including um, the Yugoslav War in the uh, late uh, 1990s. And of course, it took over um, uh, ISAF in Afghanistan quite early on into that conflict, which was um, 
defeated after 20 years. It also uh, took over a central role in Iraq. It has been involved itself in all sorts of conflicts, um, none of which have resulted in peace and security. And the idea that NATO is somehow going to uh, bring this about, it seems to me, is... Um, is absolutely fanciful. So I think these are the serious questions we've got to ask about. We also have to ask about um, the wider questions, if you like. I referred to Lebanon, Sophie referred to Lebanon at the beginning. But what we're seeing worldwide is an arms race of, of incredible proportions, that the level of arms spending is rising exponentially um, the arms companies are finding their dividends and their share prices are growing and growing and growing. This is a result partly of the Ukraine war and the huge rearmament in Europe um, as a result of it, particularly in Germany, which no doubt Reiner will be um, will be referring to. Um, but it's also a result of the Middle East. And of course, thirdly, it's a result of the um, uh, the growing arms race in the Pacific um, aimed at uh, the Western powers, including the NATO powers, which are um, attempting to build up a military presence against China. So Japan, for example, is going to be the third biggest arms spender in the world by 2030. So all of these are real um issues for us and of course when you talk about an arms race of this proportion when you talk about it covering large parts of the globe as it does then you're talking about um a drive to war if you look before 1914 the arms race then didn't result in peace it resulted in war if you look at the 1930s the arms races then didn't result in peace they resulted in war and we're seeing this again today in very very dangerous circumstances and uh, all of the things that it uh, that it means for us. So the final point I wanted to make is what it means for the people in, um, not just in Ukraine and Russia, but what it means for people in Britain, in the United States and Germany and France and all the other powers that are engaged in sending, um, sending weaponry and missiles to Ukraine and which are backing Israel um, in the Middle East. And there's no coincidence about these. Our government this week, the new Labour government that we have under Keir Starmer and David Lammy, who is the Foreign Secretary, uh, Lammy announced another 600 million immediately to go to Ukraine. This is on top of over 7 billion um, uh, military aid to Ukraine since, since the war began um, two and a half years ago. Uh, he also said we are going to provide Ukraine with 3 billion pounds a year every year for as long as it takes now this is a, a time when as people in britain will be well aware that the labor government has decided to cut the fuel allowance to um british pensioners who are already one of the poorest pensioners groups of pensioners in europe this saves them 1.5 billion a year so they're cutting that at the same time they're committed to sending double that amount as military weaponry aid to Ukraine. It's an absolute um, disgrace. And it tells you the priorities of these countries is not about uh, the peace and prosperity of their own populations and other people's populations. They talk about Ukrainian population and they want to help them, but they will do nothing to help them um, in the longer term. And this war is not helping the people of Ukraine. So uh, this is uh, the final point is this brings the urgency of peace talks and ceasefire. Now, I think if we're going to be perfectly honest about any of these peace talks and any ceasefire, they don't solve all of the problems of the region or indeed solve the long term problems which exist in a world which is so militarized and where, where there is so much conflict in it. But they are at least a precondition for ending this war immediately, for stopping the drive to war and for beginning to develop foreign policies and existence between nations which are based on cooperation and um, and coexistence rather than on the imperialist drive to war that we are seeing now. So I think it's very, very urgent we do link all these questions together and redouble our efforts to oppose what is going on over Ukraine. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Lindsay. And as you say, we've got to redouble our efforts, haven't we? Um, so our next speaker, we're delighted to welcome Rainer Brown, 
Um, he's based in Germany, as well as being um, a journalist and an author. He's the executive director of the International Peace Bureau, which is one of the, the world's oldest international peace federations. So we're delighted to have you with us, Rainer. Over to you. Thank you, Sophie, and thank you for the invitation. Let me first say, I think we all cannot believe what it means to have the third winter of war in front of you. It's a war without water, the war without heat, the war without energy, because everything is destroyed. And this shows the suffering of the people in Ukraine. And these underline for me the need, and I will come back to you this a little bit later, the fight for ceasefire negotiation and ending the war. But I was asked to speak about the German role in the war. When I speak about the German role, you can always say German slash European Union, because Germany is playing in these wars a key role as a leading organization in the European Union. And maybe surprisingly for you, I will not start with the finances. I will start with Rammstein. The US airbase in Rammstein is one of the key organizing centers for Germany, the European Union, and the NATO for organizing their support for the war. Quite all satellites, information to Ukraine, are coming from the US airbase Rammstein. In the US airbase Rammstein, all strategic decision of the engagement of the NATO countries and Germany will be made by the so-called Rammstein coalition of leading, leading countries, which are 44 countries of the world, NATO countries and some NATO supporting countries, mainly from Asia and one from Africa, Kenya, the only one. And also the, all the information for the artillery engagement for many war offensive in Ukraine are coming from the satellite systems organized over Rammstein. So Rammstein plays a key role for organizing the NATO support for the war and gave the technical details in, and information to the Ukraine army for organizing their battles and fight. And definitely Rammstein is lying on German soil. This means Germany is an active part of this war. Even when our governments deny that they are really engaged in the war, they are in reality. Second, the financial conditions. When you combine the support from the, from the United States, who's always saying it's the leading role in financing the war and the support, the same amount of money, about 100 billion US dollar is coming from the European Union and half of this money, quite 50%, is coming from Germany. So we are deeply engaged with the finances in this war. And I will not repeat what Lindsay was saying to the social conditions in Great Britain. I can only say the social conditions in Germany are quite equal. We have the same. We have 40% poor people in the country. We have 20% poor children in the country. We have a massive deindustrialization of our economy. And we have social con consequences, which you can see in the infrastructure, the healthcare system, the, the education system, the science, the universities, wherever you want to see it. So these are the consequences up to now. And because we have the same situation, cut down for half, 1 billion and giving these billion to Ukraine. This is the day-to-day -day business of our government. So these are the financial conditions. And the next point for the financial conditions is we have about 1 million refugees from Ukraine in Germany. And we have the status of first class and second class refugees. First class refugees, please excuse you when I'm saying this, are your friends and colleagues from Ukraine. They are welcome, they get money, they get even housing, they have not to work, they can work, they get immediate possibilities for learning German and 
German language, and an end. And then we have the second class, refugees. They are coming from Iraq. They are coming from Afghanistan. They are coming from Syria. They are coming from Africa. They got nothing or only very small amount of support. And they have today with their day-to-day -day situation that we want to send them immediately back. Even when they ask for essay or are coming from countries where they were tortured or killed or had the danger of being killed. So this is the second situation. And these refugees are not cheap. And, you know, we have in mind, and this is the official data from today, that over the winter, 400,000 more refugees from Ukraine will come to Germany. I will not accuse the refugees. I'm accusing the conditions under what they are. They have to come and that our government is doing nothing, really nothing for diplomacy and ceasefire. Next point for our big support, we have trained up to now 20,000 Ukrainian soldiers and officers in army centers in Germany. This is the biggest number of, of troops which were educated outside of Ukraine. They are living, are coming partly for three months, partly for half a year. The pilots even for longer to Germany and are trained here. This, so we are really a big supporting country for the Ukrainian war. What we are not doing, we are not doing any initiative for getting ceasefire and negotiations. There is no diplomacy from our foreign ministry and from our government. Nothing, else, nothing. And what we as peace movement are calling for is independently how we are discussing the development to the war and the responsibility of different forces for the war, we are calling for ceasefire and negotiations. And we are calling, and in this case, we have the support even of some social democratic leading persons in the, in the social democratic party. We are calling for the internet, for an international contact group which is preparing negotiations and ceasefire. This international contact group was on one side suggested from the German chair of the German faction of the parliament, Rolf Mützenich, but also suggested from the government of Brazil and China. And I think this contact group could be an interesting group coming together from the countries I mentioned and maybe some others from the African Union and, and to start a preparing a process of diplomacy that leads to negotiation and ceasefire. This will not happen from today to tomorrow. The political positions of both sides are very different. The speeches and the propaganda is high. So this needs a really interesting development. And maybe we can go back to some of the results of the Istanbul discussions and Istanbul negotiations in 20, April and May 2022, but we have to see how are the new conditions. So that is the point we are calling for diplomacy and for these activities. And we are now, and this is my final words, we are not only calling, we are also actively preparing actions of the peace movement. We are in the preparation of national-wide demonstration on October 3rd, which is in Germany a national holiday, uh, which has one of the key points next to calling for disarmament and uh, for ceasefire also in Gaza, has Ukraine as a key point. And I think what we need is more common actions of the European peace movement. I think we have to discuss between us about the follow-up of the Vienna conference and have to think about bringing together the peace groups and the peace activists in developing more power and more engagement for forcing our governments to Ukraine. Why I'm saying this at the end, you all, maybe you know, the decision of the European Parliament from last week. The decision of the European Parliament was, and I cannot say this in other words, the preparation of the Third World War. Because when the European Union calls for long missiles engagement against Russia to destroy Moscow city and all the military centers of Russia. This is calling for a third world war. And this is so irresponsible for the European Union 
Parliament is doing, that we really have to think about more common actions of the European Union countries and the peace movement in the different European countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reiner. And yes, it is very, very dangerous situation as you outline, you know, preparation potentially for World War Three. Um, so, yeah, as you say, like the cooperation of the peace movements across Europe is like, you know, absolutely critical. Um, now, unfortunately, Tariq Ali was going to be with us tonight, but unfortunately, he's not very well. So we wish him all the best and a speedy recovery. Um, but our next speaker, uh, we're delighted to have with us um, tonight. It's Yuri Shelyokenko, uh, sorry, um, Ukrainian peace activist. He's a board member of the European Bureau for Conscientious Objection. He's a journalist, blogger, and a human rights defender. People might know that last year he was disgracefully placed under house arrest for his uh, pacifist views. But as you can see, he remains unbowed. So we're delighted to have you with us, Yuri. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Sophie, for introduction. Dear friends, uh, greetings from Kyiv. Here in Ukraine, people suffer from Putin's escalation of his cruel genocidal conquest. Russian army bombs Kharkiv into rubbles, attacked with deadly rockets a retirement house in Sume and Children Hospital here in Kyiv. At least uh, 12,000 civilians were killed and 25,000 injured in result of Russian aggression, according to UN. Barbaric destruction of power station led to blackouts affecting millions of Ukrainians, and it uh, going to be worse at winter. There is a fear that Russia could attack three Ukrainian nuclear power plants. Putin must cease the escalation of his war of aggression and stop all military attacks against Ukraine, according to the order of the International Court of Justice of 16th March 2022. North Korea and Iran should not supply rockets and drones for Putin's carnage and demolition of Ukraine from the world map. We must remember also that the court ordered both Ukraine and Russia to refrain from any action which might aggravate or extend the dispute between the court regarding allegations of genocide. In that light, any mass murder during the war, basically any act of war, looks suspiciously. Uh, we in the War Resistance International believe that all war is a crime against humanity, and therefore I am determined not to support any kind of war and to strive for the removal of all causes of war. I found repulsive bloodshed, weapon supplies, cyber rattling of military alliances. All of this, and especially catastrophic nuclear stockpiles under Kremlin and White House, make me worry worry about survival of humans and all life on our common planet. Some people believe that such things are necessary for security and uh, they take as insult or even treason any expression of pacifist opinions. I could be sentenced up to five years of prison for my advocacy of peace and right to refuse to kill. And yet I believe uh, that we can and we need to stop Russian aggression by nonviolent action. It takes long-term thinking, education and innovation, hard work for big structural changes. Without long-term thinking and without recognition that peace requires justice, it would be futile to try to persuade people they don't need the NATO, the nukes, the long-range missiles, the propaganda, the armies, and other little machinery of war for their safety. When people rely on defending army to save them from attacking army, they will reject with fury suggestions of diplomacy, and they will demand uh, uh, for their army as many deadly toys as possible. And the dangerous, the better. Don't blame Ukrainian people for that old-fashioned instinct, which is widespread in the East and in the West. I believe it is always better to talk instead of killing. But I know it is possible, while many people just don't know it is possible and they don't believe it is possible. That's why 
peace education efforts are crucial and desperately needed. And I launched this summer a school of pacifism in Ukraine. Even those who know power of nonviolence and diplomacy on both sides among aggressors and their supporters and victims and our supporters on both sides uh, people are under pressure of the industry of war, which has its ways to misrepresent choices between nonviolence and violence and mislead people towards the violence. Yet people are tired of madness, of hatred and mass killing. Every sane person is tired of war and wants peace. Remember, peace is human right. So we see that a growing number of people in Russia want to end attack on Ukraine, want to negotiate. In Ukraine, many people also want a fair peace. President of Ukraine Volodymyr Zelensky proposed 10 points Ukraine's peace formula based on requirements of United Nations Charter and values of democracy, peace and justice universally shared among international community. A first peace summit in Switzerland approved the peace formula uh, in aspects of nuclear safety, global food security, and prisoner exchanges. We saw it, it was good. Uh, joint communique of the peace summit uh, says that reaching uh, peace requires dialogue between all parties. To end the war as quickly as possible, during his speech at the United Nations Security Council, President Zelensky invited everyone who respects the UN Charter to join the Second Peace Summit. Responding to these aspirations and the invitation to the Second Summit on Peace in Ukraine, Russian Foreign Ministry excluded participation in the Second Peace Summit, and uh, Putin's press secretary stated uh, that uh, the war will end only when the military goals will be achieved. It is, it is said that Putin don't want to negotiate peace. President Zelensky also expressed his feelings that the peace plan proposed by China and Brazil insufficiently reflects interests and rights of Ukraine. But uh, Zelensky invited China and Brazil to the Second Peace Summit, uh, where they could contribute to genuine peace process. I think it is good uh, that we have a variety of different peace plans and could choose the best options to implement. When uh, people have lack of faith in peace, discussion of peace plans could change the narrative of endless war. The faith could make miracles, and we saw that uh, when Ukrainians stopped Russian tanks protesting, unarmed uh, on the way of Kremlin war machines, that is power of nonviolence. A few days ago, on the International Day of Peace, international uh, Ukrainian pacifist movement adopted a plan of our own and published a statement, Ukrainian vision of peace. We remind uh, that the Declaration of State Sovereignty of Ukraine in 1990 proclaimed that Ukraine does not participate in military blocs and adheres to three non-nuclear principles, not to accept, not to produce, and not to acquire nuclear weapons. We also remind that Ukrainians are victims of brutal Russian aggression, and uh, Ukrainians have the right to fair compensation for the suffering and return of what was conquered by Putin's army of war criminals. Victims' dignity, victims' right, rights is important. Uh, it should be restored. Uh, compensation and Kremlin dictator must withdraw his troops. We demand also that everyone who proposes peace plans must necessarily include in these plans a long-term vision of a peaceful future without wars, a realistic path to eternal peace. We need global peaceful transformations and more effective global nonviolent governance, involving the efforts of world peace movements into successful activities of the United Nations and achieving such a power of nonviolent actions that will be able to stop Russian aggression. We, the pacifists, know that the highest law of life is uh, you sh should not kill. Uh, therefore, we cannot become soldiers, murderers, and executioners. This is a key point in our strategy uh, to approach peace. Because of that, I urge you to support global campaign Refuse War and European campaign Object War, 
aimed at full compliance of all countries with standards of human right to conscientious objection to military service in international law. Uh, aimed at protection at asylum for conscientious objectors and deserters from Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. Indeed, those brave people who refuse uh, to kill despite all persecutions deserve universal support. In Russia and Belarus, dictator Putin and his authoritarian accomplice Lukashenko cruelly repress anti-war activists. In Ukraine, after the full-scale Russian invasion, there were 18 prison sentences for conscientious objectors, mostly three years of jail, and uh, 25 suspended prison sentences. The army does not recognize human right to conscientious objection. There is no alternative service, as was in peacetime. So, Ukrainian pacifist movement exhausted all domestic legal remedies and complained to European Court of Human Rights. But it could take years to find justice in Strasbourg. Still, we believe that human rights must be defended nonviolently. And we believe, and we invite everyone to believe, that in the world where everyone will refuse to kill, there will be no wars. That is our long-term vision of peace. And without this long-term vision, any short-sighted peace plans will be incomplete and flawed. I will conclude with the words of open letter of 10 Ukrainian human rights defenders imprisoned in Gulag. In 1980, they wrote, to achieve peace, we must abandon hatred and ideologies of war. We must disarm our hearts and souls. Thank you so much, Yuri. Um, I think, you know, the, the points that you're making about how everybody is tired of war and they want peace are so, are so important and so powerful. Um, like you say, peace education is just absolutely vital. Thank you so much for being part of our panel today. Um, so I'm now going to move on to our final speaker, um, Kate Hudson. Um, is the General Secretary of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, um, and she's a leading anti-nuclear and anti-war campaigner. So it's great to have you here. Over to you, Kate. Thanks very much, Sophie, and thanks so much to our other speakers. And of course, in particular, I'd like to express our solidarity and support for you, Yuri. It's hard to imagine for us here, where I'm in London, it's hard to imagine what the terrible situation you and so many others find yourselves in. So we're sending our love and support to you. And I think Sophie's quite right in saying um, that people are very tired of the war, very um, sad, very traumatized by the war uh, beyond even the borders of Ukraine. And that's very, very clearly expressed by many recent opinion polls which show that two thirds of Europeans want their leaders to push for a negotiated settlement. So in spite of, of everything that's said by our leaders um, about the necessity for fighting on and uh, sending more weapons to Ukraine, the people themselves understand what the reality is and they want that negotiated peace settlement. So I'd like uh, to look in a bit more detail at the nuclear issue as has been mentioned, we're facing the prospect of nuclear war in Europe. It's the first time this prospect has really uh, reared its head uh, in several decades, perhaps not since the 1980s. And of course, as Ryan has said, there have been plenty of headlines about the risk and even talk of World War III. And of course, it's not surprising. It's, it's not overstating the case to raise those concerns because there is an imminent risk of direct war between Russia and NATO. Think about the arsenals that are there. Both NATO and Russia have in the region of five and a half thousand nuclear weapons, of which around 17 to 1800 are deployed on both sides. And the power of these weapons can be dozens of times that of the Hiroshima bomb. So we're talking about catastrophic nuclear force. 
But with all those headlines, what has been absent, of course, is serious discussion about how to avoid that scenario. And instead, we've seen numerous NATO leaders advocating courses of action that would lead to a direct conflict between Russia and NATO. So in other words, fast track to nuclear catastrophe. Um, early in the war, we heard many voices calling for a no-fly zone to be established by NATO. And of course, that would have led to NATO shooting down Russian planes. And fortunately, that was avoided. And then another example was President Macron's proposal in February of this year. He said that ground troops should be deployed to Ukraine. Now, as it turned out, this was too extreme, even for other NATO leaders, but other escalatory ideas are still on the table. And in particular, the current disastrous proposal of sending Ukraine long range missiles that can hit deep into Russia. I know that's at the forefront of all our concerns. And Keir Starmer has been a strong advocate for sending UK French storm shadow missiles. And strangely enough, he's actually been restrained so far by President Biden. So that's, but that danger remains. This week's UN General Assembly and Security Council sessions have had a significant focus on Ukraine, putting it back at the centre of the world stage, not least because of Zelensky's presence there and his talk of what he calls a plan for victory. And of course, as we might expect, key to this is ramping up efforts to get the restrictions eased on the use of long range missiles. But he's also, as has been said, made big efforts to try and discredit peace initiatives, such as that of Brazil's President Lula and the Chinese government. So, and Zelensky has also appealed to the global south to change position on the war. And of course, we've seen how over the years, um, mostly countries in the global south have not backed NATO's position. So he's trying to change that. Today, and I haven't seen the results of the outcomes of this discussion, Putin was chairing a meeting of Russia's Security Council, specifically on the question of nuclear policy, Russian nuclear policy. And he was focused on how Russia should respond to the possibility of NATO missile strikes into Russia. And it's thought by commentators and analysts that Russia is likely to be revising its nuclear doctrine. In other words, uh, revising the circumstances in which it might resort to the use of nuclear weapons. So according to current Russian nuclear policy, nuclear weapons could be used, quotes, in response to the use of nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction against it or its allies, and where the very existence of the state is threatened by conventional weapons. So this would also include if there are attacks on critically important Russian government or military facilities that could undermine the country's retaliatory nuclear strike capability. So any indication that NATO could launch a preemptive strike on Russian nuclear facilities would be likely to trigger a nuclear response. And given that Ukraine has already used US supplied weapons for strikes into Russian territory, it seems that we could be getting close to the threshold for nuclear use, even the already existing threshold. So it's not yet known what changes are likely to be made to the policy, but there are voices within the Kremlin urging Putin to lower the threshold for use. And at an international forum in St. Petersburg in June, Sergei Karaganov, who's a foreign policy expert who advises the Kremlin, he urged Putin to amend the doctrine and he said, I hope it will be changed soon to give you the formal right to respond to any strikes on our territory with a nuclear strike. So calling for an escalation 
of Russian nuclear policy. And at that time, Putin responded cautiously to such suggestions. He said that he currently saw no threat that would warrant nuclear weapons use, but he also held the door open to revising that possible that that possible that sorry that policy. So Ukraine's potential use of NATO long-range missiles into Russia is exactly the sort of trigger that will result in a change in Russian nuclear policy and actual use of nuclear weapons. So that's on the Russian side. Then we should also note that since the war began, there has been a stepping up of NATO's nuclear weapons capacity in Western Europe. So the process of upgrading NATO nukes across bases in Western Europe is ongoing, including plans to return US nukes to Britain, that's to Lake and Heath Air Base in Suffolk. As a result of that, Russia has deployed tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus. And discussion amongst NATO states about the use of so-called battlefield nukes in the war has also elevated the threat. And it has to be remembered that many of these supposedly smaller nuclear weapons are themselves many times the size of the Hiroshima bomb. So there is no sense in which their impact could be confined to the battlefield. In terms of NATO, its current nuclear strategy reflects the US doctrine of ambiguity. So it does not specify the circumstances under which it would be willing to use nuclear weapons. But actually, the UK is slightly more forthcoming about its policy. So in 2021, Boris Johnson's government produced its integrated review of foreign and military policy. It announced a 40% increase in the UK's nuclear arsenal. And it reaffirmed that Britain's longstanding position that nuclear weapons would only be used in extreme circumstances of self-defense. It also stated that Britain will not use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against any non-nuclear weapon state signed up to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. But this assurance, they went on to say, does not apply to any state that's in breach of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And so Britain could interpret that as it wished so this is not a good thing. And there was also a new proviso that was introduced by the Boris Johnson government, um, which basically increased the range of scenarios in which Britain would use nuclear weapons. And it stated, we reserve the right uh, to review this assurance of non-use if the future threat of weapons of mass destruction, such as chemical and biological capabilities or emerging technologies that could have a comparable impact makes it necessary. So there's potential there, essentially, for using nuclear weapons in many non-nuclear military scenarios and even possibly in relation to something like a cyber attack. You know, so there's this kind of massive expansion of uh, Britain's nuclear use policy. Part of the risk of nuclear escalation stems from the systematic destruction of nuclear weapons controls that have been largely initiated by the United States. So we can look back to President Bush's withdrawal of the United States from the ABM Treaty in 2002, then withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal in 2018, and withdrawal from the INF Treaty in 2019. So it's this kind of systematic US withdrawal from all these constraints. Um, so alongside um, withdrawal from other associated treaties, this has pretty much destroyed the whole regulatory framework. There is one treaty left, the New START Treaty, which you may remember was signed by Presidents Obama and Medvedev in 2011. And this has actually overseen significant bilateral reductions between Russia and the US. Good. Um, but it's due to expire in 2026 and it needs to be renewed. However, last year, Russia suspended its participation. It will continue to abide by the agreed limits, but it is not discussing the renewal that is so essential. So we have to really 
work to try and get that treaty renewed. Otherwise, there will be no constraints on nuclear weapons production. So, to conclude, the world is not in a good place in nuclear terms. Last year, for the first time since the end of the Cold War, the global nuclear arsenal increased after three decades of steady reductions. The new nuclear arms race, therefore, is well underway and the risks are increasing. So this war, this terrible war in Ukraine, must end. A peace settlement must be negotiated to end the terrible killing and the suffering and the destruction, but it must also end to ensure that this escalation towards nuclear war stops and we must step up our opposition to both war and nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kate. A very powerful conclusion there that we have to sort of basically redouble our efforts to stop war and the escalation of nuclear weapons. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Um, that's the end of our uh, panel discussion tonight. Um, so just before we go, I mean, you know, just really to sort of reiterate, I think the point that Kate made about the fact that like public opinion is on our side um, across Europe and in, and in the United States, a massive majority wanting a negotiated settlement. You know, as Yuri says, people are, are so tired of war and they want peace. So we've got to keep up the pressure on, on the British government um, to stop their role in terms of the escalation, particularly in terms of stopping the use of these long range missiles that like are, are such a catalyst for um, increasing the nuclear threats. Um, we need to coordinate, um, you know, further, as Ryan was saying, across Europe um, around our opposition to um, to war and these dangers. Um, certainly, there are some really important events coming up in the next few days um, and weeks that we would really encourage you to to take part in. Tomorrow, there's the emergency rally, Hands Off Lebanon, um, which is taking place um, at Downing Street um, at six. 6 p.m. So please try and make that. Um, on the 5th of October, Saturday the 5th, there's a national demonstration in London um, calling again for a ceasefire um, in Gaza and Lebanon um, and against the genocidal war that's being carried out by, by Israel. Um, we'd also really encourage everyone to register for CND's conference, which is taking place on the 12th of October. That's the world we want, a new agenda for peace and justice. Um, and also, um, Kate was mentioning about Lake and Heath. So we're going to be having um, a demonstration there on Saturday, the 2nd of November, um, up at Lake and Heath in Suffolk. So please join us there. That's against um, um, US nuclear weapons coming to Britain and putting us on the front line. So as always, you know, there's a huge amount for us to do, but like it's history has shown that it's political protest it's public pressure that can really change things and brings about you know peace and stops sort of nuclear weapons from being used so you know let's just redouble our efforts and um and keep going thank you very much bye bye <laughs>